The title of today is Abolishing War. Beyond imagination? Why do we take it up to those high-flown levels? Beyond imagination, it happens all the time. Social change marches forward, and we just don't realize what's happened in history when we think of the past. All those brave suffragettes in the pre-World War I time uh, were actually people without the vote. They didn't have a vote uh, at that time. They were campaigning for that and for many other things as well. But it was normal. If you got to be an old chap, 65 was an old chap, by which time I'm a very old chap, but 65 was an old chap, and you hadn't got any dosh, you were divided. Husbands into this workhouse, um, wives into that workhouse. All regimented, dormitory living, and so on. And when the campaign started, it was a New Zealand clergyman started it in England in 1898, I remember it well. He began the campaign last year for 10 years and turned things all around. Eventually Lloyd George, who was no idiot, he came along and realised there was votes in it. And so he began to say, well, we ought to have a pension for women and men and an old age pension. It was all means tested, but the, the barrier was broken. We now have a National Health Service. I remember my parents, who were quite well off, ringing up the doctor to come round. But you paid for him to come round. And if you were poor, you didn't ring up the doctor because he couldn't come round and he wouldn't come round. And that was the situation in the 1930s. And I think we should count our blessings and think of the people in the past who've campaigned for these things. It didn't drop from the sky that we've moved as far as we have. People have worked for years and years and years to make the world a better place. And in our country we have this mystical system called the charitable status. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Uh, almost straight out of the church, charitable status. But it's a clever device, actually, by the management of the country to make sure you rein in people who might be too radical. The charitable status means you can do things which are acceptable to the bulk of the people, and then you get some financial rewards. The government dishes out money in one way or the other through different agencies to the charities, but it doesn't give it to the non-charities, who actually want rather more radical change to come about quickly. And that creates all kinds of tensions, let's face it, within organisations and between organisations. And the other thing is, quite truthfully, um, this is not a public confession, but I'm willing to make one if you want, um, if you do too, um, uh, uh, is, is the, uh, is the uh, competition of egos. We're not short of egos in the peace and development world. We're quite rich in egos. But we, would, we wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have a bit of an ego because we want something to happen. We want our views to count. And so we are quite significant people and we don't like people pushing us into the shade. But you have other problems, much larger problems, I think. And that is the problem, first of all, of uh, political acceptance and media manipulation. We've been having uh, an absolute dose, I don't know how it is here, of World War I. World War I, non-stop on television and radio, on and on and on. But the question that doesn't get asked, why did we have a World War I? What happened to Tsar Nicholas in 1899 who called for a major conference on the elimination of the causes of war in, in Europe and in the world? And it took place. And we, the Brits... We sent who? Admiral Fisher, the biggest warmonger of the day, was sent to the Tsar's conference. Uh, and the others did the same. The Kaiser wouldn't even come himself to the conference. And when they sent him a message saying, we've passed this general re resolution in favour of peace, the Kaiser wrote back a message saying, you can pass it, but I shall H-S-I-T on your resolution. Very, very rude. That's why I'm spelling it out. Well, they took that to be an affirmative vote. Um, uh, <laughs> amazingly. And so it was passed unanimously. But there was a dream. There was a hope. And the hope was ignored. And what about the women of 1915, who are now turned up as being the International League of Peace and Freedom? The WILF. Um, wonderful people ignored. Uh, they had a fantastic meeting in The Hague in 1915. They went off to Wilson. They went to every head of state saying, stop it. Do you hear anything about this kind of thing in the history of the First World War? It's been airbrushed out of existence. And we should not. People who are peace people should be as peace historians as well. And we should be um, resurrecting and in our press and on our media demanding that these kind of amazing initiatives that took place in the past continue. 
We have uh, near us in North Enfield, uh, near Epping, a monument put up by Sylvia Pankhurst. She was the radical daughter, Sylvia, and she went to Ethiopia and she was totally dismayed at the failure of the first League of Nations peace conference in Geneva, 1915. And she put a statue up outside saying, thanks to the British government, we can go on bombing the Ethiopians. Well, I don't know how she got away with it, with public planning permission, but the statue's still there. It's now a grade two little building and to be protected. There were people whose histories need to be known about. I think there is hope, great hope, when you begin to talk about the heroes of the past. My particular hero, Franz Jägerstatter. Nod if you know anything about Franz Jägerstatter. No nods. That's excellent. Well, I'll now tell you. That's another half an hour. Sorry. Um, uh, Jägerstatter, a little Austrian farmer, 1940, called up to the German army, went for six months, began to think about what was going on, sent back to continue as a farmer, called up again in 1943, and he said in simple language, an ordinary man, he said, Hitler is gobbling up the world. I will not be party to gobbling up the world. He married three little girls. Uh, put in prison, beheaded in August of 1943, forgotten, but actually discovered by that great historian Gordon Zahn and the wonderful book, A Solitary Witness. These are the people we want to raise up as our heroes, the male, male heroes, female heroes, Sylvia Pankers, whatever. We've got to resurrect our own history so that we actually know what's gone on in the past and who we can be brave about. In this country, Sean McBride, his international commitment was fantastic. Sean McBride had a real vision of a world of peace based on law. He is somebody in Ireland we should be looking up to because he was a remarkable, remarkable man. He had a great gift. He, I think he was a bit deaf as well. When he didn't like the way the argument was going, he took out his hearing aids and put them on the table. And, and uh, when the person had finished speaking, he put them back in again. And then they said, I suppose there was a unanimous vote, wasn't there, in favour of my position? So everybody said yes. So he knew how to manipulate things. But he was a very brave man. I've never forgotten him in Stockholm um, after a conference and a snow was falling at 10 o'clock at night. Old Sean trudging through the snow, aged 85 or 86, on the snow towards his hotel with his shoulders down. I thought, there is a brave man, and his internationalism is something we should all live up to. We need imagination and we need unity. Uh, the peace and development movement needs unity, and we ourselves need ad imagination to see how we can move forward and attract other people. Doing the same thing over and over again can be a bit boring. I'm delighted to be here, this is my last word, because I've been invited by AFRI. And there's a whole range of different... Now, you sit down, I've not finished with you. Um, uh, there's a whole range of development organisations. But, but AFRI is a bit unique. AFRI is both willing to take on the military side of poverty in this world in a brave way, which is what I'm here, I suppose, really. And it's also willing to pick up on people who are not madly popular uh, with the world of world, Bradley Manning, for instance. And I think AFRI has a great track record and I'm very proud to be here with them. It also has a, a great ability to create a bit of fun. And I'm sure there'll be some fun before we're finished. The last time I came down to Kildare, there was a sing-song and a great deal of beer flowing and I look forward to such an evening tonight. Thank you very much for having me.